Welcome to the U World Order Showcase Podcast. Your host, Jill Hart, the coach's alchemist. Couldn't be more excited to have you join us today. On this podcast, we celebrate the champions of change, the up and coming life, health and transformational coaches who are fearlessly stepping forward to make a difference in the world. Get ready for inspiring stories, practical tips, and powerful moments that will motivate you to make a positive change in your life and those around you. We're happy to have you join us on this incredible journey as we dive into the world of life, health, and transformational coaches who are lighting up the path towards a better tomorrow. Hi, and welcome to the U World Order Showcase podcast. Today, we are speaking with Rebecca Ola. Rebecca is a child suicide mental health advocate, and she she and I have been chatting offline for several months now, and I've, I feel really passionately about what she's doing as far as bringing attention to the world about the massive increase in in teen suicide that's happening around the globe. So welcome to the show, Rebecca. I know this is a really serious topic, and I know it's one that's near and dear to your heart as well as mine. So share with us what you're doing, what tidbits of information you have to help us reach our teens more effectively. Well, first of all, um, I'm going to hit you with a statistic. Teenage suicide is the second leading cause of death in teenagers. And you can't ignore that. Um, There is a whole, um, there's a whole group of not my kid. It's actually a syndrome. And nobody wants to think that their kids would do that. But at the time I was a teenager, you didn't go to your parents. You went to your friends, and your friends are teenagers too, and they're really mixed up. But I think a lot of the problem is that people feel like they don't have time to talk to their kids. Um, their kids are just fine, or else they can come to them. But we grew up where we wouldn't go to our parents. So, um, Tell your story. Oh, okay. When I was 16, I started to get very depressed. And one day, I went into the girls' bathroom as the bell rang in high school. And I sat down on the floor, and I hit the back of my head against the wall until it bled. And I turned around, and I thought it was pretty. And I said to myself, pretty? That's not normal. I couldn't go to my parents. So I went to my art teacher. And I went to my creative writing teacher. But these teachers have 20 to 30 kids for five hours. I went to the school counselor. And she actually had me sit in to help with my friends thing. But so I didn't feel like I had any recourse. So I attempted to take my own life. Um, It was a serious attempt. I'm very lucky to still be here. But if I had had parents who had taken an interest, made me feel safe, I wouldn't have tried it. I don't think a lot of teens would try it if they just felt safe talking to their parents. So the main focus I have today is making time you don't have to make a lot of time but hi how'd your day go that won't work (laughs) i know that some of it is going to be uncomfortable but um if your kid doesn't feel safe to come to you and they get suicidal 
if you can cut it off at that point, if you can recognize it at that point, you can get them therapy and maybe medication. The two first symptoms of teenage mental illness are depression and anxiety. But you can tell if your kids are unhappy because they'll sleep too much or not enough. They start to overeat or undereat. But all of that, if you're not looking, you're not going to get it. I think the best thing to do is just talk to your kids and listen, active listening. Most people, when they talk, they think about what they're going to say next instead of what they're hearing so they don't hear it. Our kids can't be committing suicide in these huge numbers. Obviously, we'd all love for them not to do it at all. But it doesn't just end one way. The siblings, you as parents, it's going to really cause a lot of depression, a lot of guilt. So take a little time. Ask your kid what they're doing. It's cool. And really listen. Ask them how they're feeling. Without judgment. Exactly. Well, when you ju- when you love, it has to be unconditional and without judgment, especially when you love your kid. If you don't understand how they're feeling or why they're feeling that, that's what Google is for. Uh, I ended up, you know, being hospitalized. And that was scary but helpful. If you're depressed or anxious, they'll probably prescribe you something. But if you look at the numbers, there's so many people taking antidepression or anti-anxiety pills. So I'm getting this a little backwards. What we want to do is establish a rapport. If you let your kids feel heard, which I believe is a basic human need, they'll talk to you. You may have to do it for a while because they're not used to talking to you. And you might have to bite your tongue a lot of times when they say things that, that kind of rub you the wrong way, or you, you're not, you're not really sure what they mean. Or even sometimes kids will say things to you for the shock value. They recognize Mm -hmm. that they're going to shock you when they tell you something. And if you can keep from, from emoting about Mm -hmm. what they're saying, just listen, ask interesting questions and be curious rather than instructive you may find that you have a larger impact on them and then they will feel heard it's hard to make a teenager feel hard they're going through so many changes and they need to have a safe place at home i grew up in a family where i wasn't allowed to show emotion so when I did try to kill myself, my parents were shocked. If they had taken an interest, even for 10 minutes a day, it wouldn't have happened. And when I told my mom, please not to tell anyone, she did child care. And she told all the moms because she felt she had to. Every single woman said they had tried that at their age. Now we're in a much different age. And with COVID, that didn't help. The isolation, you don't have to be friends with your kid, your parents. But your kid has a lot to talk about. It might not be so important that you need to take them to therapy. It might just be little things at first. Like, I'm going to the prom and I'm so excited. But if I show you a picture of myself two weeks before I tried to kill myself, I was a happy person. Starting a dialogue starts with trust. If you don't understand something, Google it. Google is your friend. (laughs) 
uh, it's hard to get behind what your teenagers are doing today because it changes so quickly. But they need you. And they need to know that you love them, like you said, without judgment. These aren't bad kids. Really, I don't think there's anything as a bad kid. The environment can change you. So once you've developed a rapport, and I would start as early as elementary school. Once you've developed a rapport, you need to establish that they really understand that you're a safe place to fall. And some kids are going to really push back. If that happens, wait it out. If it still happens, I suggest group therapy. Because that generally happens if a kid has bad secrets and they want to tell you, but they don't feel safe. And you can actually spot mental illness. Um, and if you catch mental illness in teenagers, not only do you make it easier on them, but it becomes easier to talk to them. What are some telltale signs, do you know, uh, for teenage mental illness? I know you depression, talked about the... Depression seems to be the worst. Um, anxiety, that kind of shows up. <laughs> But depression sometimes doesn't. I remember smiling through everything. When inside, all I wanted to do was die. And like I said, if my parents had let me come to them, I wouldn't have gotten to that point. So communication, of course. But then there are things that you can see in the DSM-5 which is the book psychiatrists use to um, see the symptoms. But the first one is generally oversleeping or undersleeping. Then worrying too much about things you can't control, uh, feeling guilty about things you didn't do, withdrawing, uh, stop doing things that brought you joy, there are a lot of hints. Oh, one thing to think about is that there are kids who are overachievers. And I knew a boy who was always perfect, always perfect. But when they were walking home and he realized that his, well, sorry, he was working full time, going to school full time on his way to being a botanist. But we're out walking back and having a lovely conversation, and he realizes that the hair, his hair, is touching his collar. He didn't get a haircut in time. He fell apart. So, overachievers sometimes just want your attention, and that's what you need to give them. I've heard that time is the best gift you can ever give. And I know that it's a two-income society or a single-parent society. And when you're done with the day, you want to relax and, and have some me time. But 10, 15 minutes out of that to maybe save your child's life. I don't see why being tired and wanting your own space could be that far affected. And plus, you had these kids. You raised these kids. You want them to be well-adjusted and happy, but you aren't giving them an example. Sometimes you think family meals are a good idea? Definitely. It's a good time to talk, and kids are more likely to open up later. I know most people right now grab something out of the fridge and eat it standing up. Or in front Just, of the TV. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Not only is that really bad for your diet, 
but the time is is wasted. Uh, I'm not talking religion. I know some people who are very religious in whatever religion they practice are um, are more likely to have dinner around the table with everybody. But, Without the television going. Yes. Yes. Or any kind of social media. I truly believe that if you're talking to your kid, you don't answer texts. My poor yeah, nephew. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, yeah, it, it's, it's so common where people will be holding their phones and pretending like they're talking to you, but they're not. You can't have two conversations on different medias at the same time. And it's really difficult to have a dinner conversation or to really listen as you're eating. I, I, we used to always have family meals, somewhat better than others. <laughs> but but it's a good it's a good time to if you can t leave all the devices in other rooms. It's just like you come into this room. We're going to eat together. We're going to talk and. What happens afterwards, that's fine. But just having that space, a safe container where everybody knows this is this is when we find out about each other's day and, and this is how we participate in in sharing what happened. It, and bonding. And bonding, yeah. Bonding over meals is a big thing. It his culturally it's always been a really big thing. Oh, yeah, it used to be absolutely required when my mom was a kid. And when I was a kid, too. <laughs> Sometimes I thought it was just so we'd do the dishes, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was able to establish that lima beans are poisonous. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and who would have known if you didn't have dinner together? Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, sitting around having dinner is a really good way to start getting in touch with your kids. If you go to your kids to talk to them and they look like they're feeling bad, instead of seeing, you're saying like, I see this, I do that. You ask them a question that is not yes or no. If they are obviously distressed, you say, it looks like you had a really hard day. I'd love for you to talk about it. And you don't interrupt them. You listen. Some kids think that parents are the enemy. I did. That's yeah, why. And I, honestly, I, in some cases, the parents are the enemy. I, I did grow up in a very abusive uh, household but not everybody does I mean I would never have gone to my parents because I would have gotten hurt but most kids that doesn't happen to however there is a, a trend that's getting worse and worse and that's bullying in school that's going to undermine your self under, undermine your self confidence and if you walk into their room or even the door, some of them don't want you to walk in their room and you say, wow, it looks like you had a hard day when I talk about it. If you just talk to them for like 10 minutes and then go have your me time and eat your meal together, it brings you so much closer. And those kids are going to grow up to be well-adjusted, happy people. They'll be successful because they had a soft place to fall. It also teaches them how to express their emotions. Like I, I can see that you're feeling angry or I can see that you're feeling irritated or I can see that you're, hey, you look really happy. Did something, what, what special thing happened today that makes your, you smile like that and genuinely be interested in both sides of the coin not just when they're like really obviously distressed 
it's and it's easy to see when teenagers are obviously distressed, but it's equally easy to see when there's something really great happened to them. And that's it's a good opportunity to start a conversation at that point when when you're on the upside, so that when those bad things do happen, and you know, everybody has a bad day once in a while. Um, then teenagers are put in a place where often they have a lot of bad days and they don't really know how to adjust to it and they don't have the training to identify what they're feeling sometimes and it, as parents it's kind of our job is to help them identify how they're feeling and and to be able to articulate what they want instead or to just look at what happened and how they maybe could navigate it better in the future so that they don't end up in the situation where they're just like feeling like they're a victim instead of being empowered to make decisions that could impact how that episode transpires in the future. Yeah, the best time to reach your kids is when they're happy. And even very depressed kids have happy time. Mm -hmm. And once you engage them with, wow, you did a great job, or do you feel like you did a great job? Mm -hmm. That makes all the difference. We're in a everybody gets a trophy time. So those kids will never feel like they won something. But they might come home and still be proud. So it's it's a lot easier. You're right. It is a lot easier to talk to them before they get depressed, before they get anxious. And kids they, are growing up. And they can even be depressed most of the time. But mm -hmm. if they're not used to you coming to them, it's easier to start coming to them and start the dialogue when they're happy so that they realize that it's safe when they're not happy because when they're not happy for them it's they're already struggling with something and then the idea of having to have a conversation with somebody they don't really trust that's difficult i would say when your kid does something great in school you go up to them and say well, you know, that was a great thing. How do you feel? I would be so proud of myself. And keep on that. Even if you find that it's hard to talk about when they're depressed, and some kids really act out when they're depressed, if you support them in the happy times, the transition is so much easier. Because then it's like, hey, you look, you look sadder than you usually are. Is something going on? You've got to get them to talk to you. Suicide being the second leading cause of death in America is unacceptable. It's, it's hideous. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. You know that a person, a teen, um, a teen kills themselves every two hours and 11 minutes. So if you're not talking to your kid, if you realize you just spent two hours and 11 minutes doing something else, somebody lost the money care. You really don't want it to be your kid. And it doesn't have to. Suicide uh, affects everyone. Uh, yeah, it's like having a grenade go off in your family. It, it, everybody's going to be injured by it. And and most people don't really want to commit suicide. They just want the pain to stop. They want hope that their life isn't going to continue on in this horrible situation that they're in. That's just like, they can't see that there's possibility for a better future. And and that's where I think the communication comes in. It's like as adults, we should be able to share with kids that 
you know, it's not always going to be like this. It's just like this for right now. It's a season. Everybody goes through seasons and some seasons are more difficult than others. That if you can help them understand that process, I think you're going to help them become more adjusted even as adults because they'll recognize that, you know, sometimes are tough, sometimes are really great. Nothing is static. You'll know when you when you succeed when they move out of the house and they still call you every day. <laughs> <laughs> and even if they don't call you, they oh, yeah. can be really successful and not even have to communicate with you at all. I, I really, I really think that you're totally right about doing it when they're happy. Um kids get objectionable when they get depressed they can even get a little violent um just not not really hurtful about throwing things at you if you come into their room and in well, that they case, can just they can just clam up a lot of mm -hmm. them just don't want to talk when they're when they're feeling bad or they're depressed they're just like i don't matter and nothing that i say is going to matter especially if you have a history with them where you're not listening to them. They're, they probably won't want to communicate with you, which is why you need to start when they're doing something positive and you can get the pattern set up for them to be able to share with you when they're not feeling well, when they're depressed. You know, the best kind of uh, celebration of their small wins. The best part of that is they see that you care. I, I don't want to see anyone fall through the cracks anymore. And we're losing therapists now. Very few people are trained to be therapists. It's harder and harder to see a therapist. But depression has different levels. Some of it is if someone like a friend or a parent or even an acquaintance in some people, if they die, that's not mental illness. Um, if they act out at a special time, if you can ask them why they're so angry or frustrated because when kids get down to it and they get low enough to try and kill themselves it can be under something that actually never happened one of the things to do is don't raise your voice don't do a long sigh I definitely don't shame them if you can get your kids into activities that they really enjoy, that's going to help them not, not just live in what's wrong in their lives. I know it, it sounds hard. Um, it's new. I think we should make this the generation where that's the norm. We're losing so many kids and I know the hell of feeling like a burden and feeling like I'm worthless feeling like how could anyone in the world ever love a person like me and to go beyond that I am with the God so there is the whole I alone know what depression right is <laughs> Those are roadblocks. So yeah, what you said, catch them when they're happy. Even a really depressed kid, or they'll have a time when they laugh. Mm -hmm. And if you say, oh, what are you laughing about? And don't judge. It makes such a huge difference. You just validate it. Often laughter is the best medicine. If you can mm -hmm. be silly with your kids sometimes, mm -hmm. it helps them to 
realize that it's okay to be silly sometimes. It's okay oh, yeah. not to take everything so seriously. Because they have so much responsibility. School's tough. I think it's harder now than it has ever been in terms of if you go to a public school. Mm-hmm. And if you go to, you know, if you're homeschooled, then I'm sure you're talking to your kids because you can't avoid it. But, you know, even if they're home, even if they're um, working at home parents and stuff, Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that they talk to their kids. It's a different concept that people from our generation have dealt with. That doesn't make it right. I'm sorry. My dog is... (laughs) <laughs> letting me know he's here he's a puppy <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of sweet I locked my cat in the bedroom she is going to gnaw on my toes when I let her out <laughs> <laughs> so Rebecca how what are you doing right now I, you said you're gonna you're writing a book and you're mm-hmm. um getting ready to launch your website are you working and you're working with schools what are what are you doing i plan to okay um after the book comes out i plan to go to everywhere from junior colleges down to middle school Mm -hmm. i also plan much later in the year or maybe in january we start doing workshops Mm -hmm. has come some parents will feel safer that way Right. There are a lot of group uh, group therapy groups out there, mm-hmm. but they don't always work, and you don't always want to go to them because there's the stigma, and that's a good thing to keep your kids away from. Having stigmas attached to them, so. I suspect that you'll have your website up by the time this is posted. And Mm -hmm. if you'll share the link with me once you do get it put together so people can get in touch with you. Um, And I know they can find you on LinkedIn and I'll put that link in the show notes as well. Um, It's been great having you on the show. I've really been looking forward to chatting with you about this for, gosh, a few months now. (laughs) (laughs) Um, what's the one thing you want to leave the audience with today? If you take your kids to therapy and it turns out they didn't need it, it's so much better than having needed it and living with regret because regret is a terrible thing. I've seen families torn up forever. Yeah, you never recover regret. from it. No. And it doesn't get better. You just have to help them learn. But yeah, don't have regrets. Don't leave your kids alone. So I guess that's the main point. It's it's not fair, these kids. And they don't have another soft place to fall. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I, um, you know, I don't have a degree. All I have is a BDTD. You've been there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of and times that's that. all it takes. Yeah. Thank you so much for tuning in to another empowering episode of the You World Order Showcase podcast. We hope you've enjoyed hearing from our incredible life, health, and transformational coaches who are making a profound impact on the world. Remember, change begins with you, and you have the power to transform your life and the lives of others. If you want to take that next step and unlock your true potential, visit thecoachesalchemist.com where you can find the three ways we can help you for free to spin your talent into gold with clarity, a system, and a plan. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an inspiring episode. 
And if you enjoyed today's show, we'd greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Your feedback means the world to us and helps us reach more people with our positive message. Stay connected with us on social media for updates, behind-the-scenes content, and upcoming guest announcements. You can find us on Facebook at The You World Order or simply visit thecoachesalchemist.com.